Things are getting serious. Today we're bringing out the big boy. Whoops. Oh, that's bad. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. As many of you may be aware, in addition to having a machine shop, I also operate a YouTube channel, which means that in addition to the machines and tools, I also have a lot of camera gear knocking around. And one of the challenges in shooting machining work is getting the camera where you need it so that you can see and also I can see. And that can be pretty challenging. I've used a number of different solutions over the years. Right now, I'm mostly using tripods and C-stands. But one of the things that I've always wanted to do is put a GoPro on an indicator stand. I've tried it. I have not had a lot of luck because the indicator stands tend to be pretty flexible and the vibration of the machine inevitably finds its way into the camera. Plus at this point, I'm not really using the GoPros, so the cameras I'm using are much heavier. I would like to give it another go though, so I picked up one of these. This is a Noga Big Boy. They sell it as an indicator holder. It comes with the hardware to hold an indicator, but this is way overkill for an indicator. However, it should have enough capacity to even hold a DSLR camera, so that's what we're gonna try today. The top ball joint just has a little threaded socket here, and it comes with the hardware to hold an indicator, but we're gonna make an adapter from this socket to a camera quick change mount so that I can mount any of my cameras on this arm. Let's take a look at what we have to work with here. This is the Noga Big Boy arm, and it is, from what I can tell, appropriately named. This thing is more rigid than anything I've handled in this class. Now, it's got a switchable magnet on the base that'll attach to any iron or steel surface. It's got an arm with a single locking knob that allows you to move it into any position and lock it. And then at the top, the top ball joint has an M6 thread for attaching the indicator holder, and that's what we're gonna take advantage of to attach a camera. Now to actually attach the camera, we're gonna use a quick release plate. This one is made by a Neewer. I got this from Amazon, but this is a clone of the Manfrotto style dovetail plate. So this plate attaches to the camera and the base attaches to the tripod head, or in this case, the arm. It's got a bunch of holes on the bottom threaded for attachment and the plate just slides in and locks. Now, one thing I love about these plates is that you can lock it with the thumb screw, but if you forget, it still can't fall out. It's positively retained and you have to actually press the button to get it out. So it reduces the chances of having an accident with the camera. I'd like to use these four quarter 20 threaded holes in the plate to attach to the one M6 threaded hole in the arm, which means we're gonna to need to make an adapter. And once we have this plate on the arm, we should be able to move it freely and point the camera in any direction we'd like. To design an adapter, I started by just modeling the top ball joint of the Noga arm. I just disassembled it, pulled out the C-clip, took the ball out and measured it up. So it's just a spherical ball with a socket on the end. There's a couple of wrench flats here for tightening it. And there's an M6 thread down inside a bore. So I just measured this up and designed a plate that will screw into this and attach to the camera plate. And here it is. Let me hide the ball here. This is just a round piece of steel with an integral stud that has a register to fit in that top opening of the ball and a thread to screw down into it. And then it's got uh, some other counterboard holes for quarter 20 screws to go into the newer camera mount plate. Now this alone would be enough if we can get this joint tight and keep it from coming loose. But I'm a little bit worried about that unscrewing, especially if I'm pointing a camera off at an angle, it's an uneven load and there's some torque force on this. So I designed in a couple of additional threaded holes for 832 set screws and those set screws will come down and bear on this collar on the top of the ball. The idea being that we can use cut point screws and those will embed themselves into this steel surface of the ball and help grip it and keep it from backing out. So we'll just screw the ball on tightly, then drive in those screws and that should be enough to keep it from coming apart. If it isn't, we might have to come back and uh, maybe grind some little divots in it, but I think the set screws with the cut points will be plenty. I put together a drawing 
that has the part we need to make shows all of the relevant dimensions so we can go to the lathe and start making it. Now, because I'm going to be hanging considerable number of dollars in camera gear off of this one single M6 stud, we definitely want to be careful about the material that we choose. We want to choose something with uh, good tensile strength uh, because if this stud breaks off, it's going to be an expensive day. I went through my scrap drawer and I found this two inch diameter piece of 1144 steel. 1144 is also sold under the name Stress Proof. It's a medium carbon resulfurized steel. It has reasonably high tensile strength, which is great for this project. And it's also good for arbors and other tool making projects because it has very low residual stress. So it doesn't tend to warp when you machine it. As usual, the first operation will be to face off the part. I want to remove the saw cut. This cuts pretty straight, so I shouldn't have to take off much material. This should clean up pretty easily. 1144 has a reputation for being pretty easy to machine. I'm using a carbide tool here so we can push it pretty hard and pretty fast, and you can see I'm not having too much trouble with this. Once that's faced, I just want to clean up the outside diameter. I don't care about the diameter, I just need it to be clean. And I am not liking those chips at all. Let me just check and make sure we've got at least three eighths of an inch and we do. I'll just break the edge of this with a chamfer tool and that's all the machining we need on this side. I'll just flip the part around in the three jaw chuck and grip it by the machine surface. I'll use some parallels to get it set up straight here. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect because this isn't a spinning part, but I'd like it to be as close as possible, at least so that it looks parallel. Get that clamped in there and start by facing off the outside edge. I just want to check and make sure we have enough thickness and we have plenty. In fact, we've got quite a bit to come off, so I'll just start pushing this. And you can see the chips are breaking okay as long as I push it pretty hard. If I just go gently, they start creating long spirals, but if I start pushing hard, it starts spraying nice little controllable short chips. Check here with the caliper and just see how much further we have to go. And yep, we got a lot to come off, so let's get to it. I found that I just have to crank pretty hard and take a pretty deep bite to get the chips to break cleanly. As long as I crank nice and fast, they're breaking okay. Get down to the end here and bring this two dimension. And that should be the final thickness. Now I will just touch off and set a dial indicator here so that zero is at my stop point. That should be 488 thou. We'll go to that and then I'll reset the indicator to zero. Now I can just feed in, the indicator will make one full revolution and stop at the zero mark. Got a lot of material here to come off, so I need to figure out a cut recipe. I'm trying different feed rates here, trying to get the chips to break and not having much luck. Start with five thou per revolution, bumped it up to seven, we'll try nine. That was 12 at about a 50 thou depth per side. That was too much. Don't have the horsepower to push that. So I'll just keep trying recipes here until I find something that works. And you can see I'm getting lots of long stringy chips. Finally getting these to break a little bit and this appears to be the magic recipe. It is 12 thou per revolution feed, taking 30 thou per side, 60 thou total off the diameter per pass. And I'm just going to run a whole bunch of passes and get this down close to our target diameter. Check with a micrometer. And we've got a little bit to go here. And I will just keep running this down. Now you'll note that I'm stopping this about 10 thou shy of the final shoulder dimension. I'm only going to 90 on the dial. And now on the last pass, I'll run it the other 10 thou in and then wind it out slowly to face off the surface. Now, because there's only about a five degree angle on the side of this insert, there's a lot of contact. It's singing a little bit, but it's doing a nice job, and I'm getting a nice finish. Now, we should be at the diameter that will fit into the socket loosely, and yes, yeah, it fits. Now, we just need to take off a little bit more material to the portion that's going to be threaded and bring it down to the major diameter of the thread. 
do the same thing here and bring it down on the last pass. We'll take it all the way to zero and then wind out to clean up the shoulder. Then we'll come in with a chamfer tool and put a nice lead in on the end of that thread because we have opposable thumbs and a chamfer tool, so why not? I'm planning to actually thread mill these threads. This is my tool post grinder that I made many years ago. There are videos on the channel about that. And when I made it, I made it to accept an ER20 collet so we can put live tooling in. This is the tool we're gonna to use today. This is a Lakeshore Carbide single form thread mill. I'll just load this up in the collet and we should be able to use it the same as we would any other kind of threading tool, except that there's no minimum speed. This thing will cut even if we're just turning it by hand, which is exactly what we'll do. Now, the first thing we need to do is get a zero. So I'll just spin up the grinder and bring the tool in until it just touches. There it is. We'll just back the tool off and we'll set the lathe up for threading. Now, this particular lathe has my electronic lead screw on it. So setting it up is easy. We'll just switch it to thread mode, switch it to millimeters, and dial up a one millimeter pitch thread. Now we can just spin this up, and you can see as I turn the chuck by hand, it's feeding in. I've got this set for a 10,000th depth of cut, and we'll just slowly make a pass here. I really don't know how this tool is gonna react, so I'll take it nice and easy. I've got it spinning about 3,000 RPM. And uh, unfortunately, it needs to go slower than the motor on my lathe will run. So I'll just turn it by hand and this will allow us to come up nice and clean right to that shoulder without going past and without having to have lightning quick reflexes. Now, also because this is a metric thread and I have an imperial lead screw, it's really best to just leave the half nut engaged. And this provides a nice, safe way to make the thread. Bring this around. I'm trying to sort of hear when it touches the shoulder. That looks about right. So we'll back it off and run the lathe in reverse to back it out. Now that was 10 thou. I figure we probably want to go about 25 thou deep uh, because I did the math wrong in my head, but as you'll see, it's going to work out anyway. So here's another 10 thou. We'll take another pass through the thread and having a little trouble turning the spindle slowly because of the resistance of the motor. But once I get it moving, it runs pretty smoothly. So that's a total depth of 20 thou. And then we'll come back and make one more five thou pass for a total depth of 25 thousandths of an inch. Bring that to the end back it off and run the lathe in reverse to back the tool up. Of course, I don't want to disengage the half nut yet because I'm not sure the thread is done. Test it here with the ball and it screws on, but it's getting a little bit tight. Let me feed in one more thou and take another pass. Whoops, uh, my brain popped out of gear and I turned on the lathe spindle instead of the live tool spindle. Fortunately, no harm, no foul. Let's back that up and try again. We'll just take one more thou off of this thread and see where we end up. And with one more thou off the thread, the fit is just about perfect. It's nice and clean, goes all the way to the bottom, seats cleanly and sticks. That is going to be perfect. Now we'll just bring in a Kratex stick, sometimes also called a Bright Boy, just to remove any rough surfaces from the thread and clean it up nice and smooth. And I'll also grab a piece of emery and just smooth out that turned surface. It was already pretty good, but you know, as long as we're here, why not? And that is that. We should be done here at the lathe. Let's take it over to the mill and put some holes in it. Gotta love that surface finish. This 1144 turns beautifully with carbide. I've got the parts set up here at the mill. I just went through my drawer and found a couple of used soft jaws from another project that already had some curved surfaces cut out of them. 
These have got some nice ledges to support the part and back them up for drilling. And I just got it centered using this uh, edge precision indicator holder. This is kind of their interpretation of the Indicol holder. I don't often recommend tools, but this indicator holder is amazing. If you don't have one, you should get one. I'll just zero out the DRO and then we can use the dimensions on the drawing to locate all the holes. And the first holes will be clearance for quarter 20 screws. Just put a short drill bit in here, move to the right coordinates and punch four holes in the part. Use some cutting oil. This 1144 definitely needs lubrication. It cuts well, but it does generate a fair bit of heat. And we'll just push the drill through and let it do its job. I am going to go a little further than necessary because I want to make sure there's a good pocket in the aluminum underneath. We're going to come back later with a counterbore and I want to make sure we have clearance for the tip of the counterbore so that it doesn't jam. These are all just symmetrical, so I just use the same offsets from the center and put in the bolt hole pattern. It's the last hole, so we'll clean up and see what we've got. That passes the sanity check. There's four holes and they look evenly spaced. So we're going to bring in a counter bore here. This is a piloted counter bore for quarter 20 or for quarter inch. So that pilot will keep it centered in the hole and the shoulder of the tool will cut the counter bore. To control the depth of the counter bore, I'll just bring the tool down and touch it to the workpiece and lock the quill. And then I'll set the quill stop to allow it to come down one quarter of an inch. And we'll just run this nice and slow so we don't burn up the tool. Put on plenty of oil and just take a nice easy cut to make the counter bore. When these tools cut well, they just cut beautifully. We'll just walk through all of the same hole locations we used when we drilled and make a nice set of four symmetrical counter bores. And of course, since we've already got it in the mill and already have the DRO zeroed, we might as well come back and put a tiny chamfer on those just to clean up the holes so they're not sharp. I wasn't really sure if I was going to be able to drill the set screw holes from this side, but it looks like we've got clearance and clearance is clearance, so we might as well save ourselves a setup. The drill does not appear to be touching, so let's get some cutting oil and go ahead and punch these holes in. Really love the way this 1144 cuts. Cuts great on the lathe, it cuts great on the mill. It's just a, a good material to work with. Very satisfying. With those holes punched all the way through, the next step is to tap them. Now I'm looking at this very carefully. Now you can see, and I can see in the video, that it is touching and slightly deflecting on that shoulder. But on the day, with magnification, I couldn't see that, so I decided to go ahead and go for it, and I got away with it. It is deflecting ever so slightly, then when it hits the hole, it deflects back. It is cutting uh, threads on the side of that shoulder, but it doesn't matter, it's not visible, and they're really just superficial anyway. Run that down, make sure it's all the way through, and then back it out. And repeat for the hole on the front side. And again, since we have the DRO zeroed, it's real easy to just drive to the hole locations and repeat operations with multiple tools. Give this a little wipe and take a good look at it and make sure we haven't forgotten anything before we take it out of this setup. Get that tap out of the way and uh, run the ball on one more time. I don't know why it wouldn't fit, but that is a really nice fit on that thread. That's very satisfying. Pull this out. The oil has it kind of stuck in there and we'll just use a little Noga deburring tool and run it around and take the edges off of all of these threaded holes. 
And that part is complete. I think there's nothing else to do but go put it together. Assembling something on the end of a Noga arm is actually pretty convenient because I can just move the ball to wherever I want it for assembly. I've got the ball reinstalled on the arm and we'll just thread this part back on and it goes down and shoulders securely. I do want to go ahead and give it a tighten with a wrench, so I'll bend this so I can get a wrench on the flats on the end of the ball, and then I'll come back with a larger pair of Kniepex pliers and just give it a nice little snug. Now we've got that on there, I want to put the set screws in to lock it in place. Now these are cup point screws, so the little raised ring on the end of the screw should bite into the steel of the ball and hold it securely in place and this should not ever unscrew on its own but i can always take the screws out if i want to take it off get those snug down and flip this over so the screws won't fall out load this up with four quarter 20 screws and just run those into the camera plate I'll get all the screws threaded and seated before I tighten any of them, and then come back, kind of visually line them up in the counter bores, and come back and torque down all the fasteners. Well, that seems pretty solid. And there's plenty of clearance to flip this around to pretty much any direction that I want to point it. I'll go grab a camera and we'll give this thing a try. This is the smaller of the two cameras I use most of the time. This is a Sony RX0 Mark II. It's a little bit bigger than a GoPro and it's in a cage that allows me to mount accessories on it. It also protects it pretty well. So this is a good candidate to put close to moving parts of machines. It's also really light and so it's easy to fit into places where I can't fit a larger camera. Of course, I use the same camera mounting plate for all of my cameras, so they're interchangeable and I could mount pretty much anything on this arm. Looks like it's pretty easy to set up a straight down macro shot for showing you things on the bench. And it's just as easy to point it horizontally to give you a slightly tilted view of the world. Hello. All in all, I think this is gonna work great and you will definitely not be seeing this in future videos, but you'll be seeing the results of it. If you enjoyed this video, Give it a thumbs up, feel free to subscribe to the channel, and leave me a comment. I'd like to know what you think. Thank you for watching.